Let me just say, after hearing Tom speak, Oregon, I, I, I like a lot of things about the Oregon wine business, but you have an amazing asset in the Oregon Wine Board. The fact that they do so much for you guys um, is, is amazing to me. I didn't know that much about them until I got involved with Tom. Um, but I mean, and that's, that's on top of, uh, I was here a year ago for Pinot Camp, and which I consider the single best marketing tool I've ever seen for any wine region anywhere in the world. And I've been to trade fairs in Europe, and I've been to events in California, but um, you guys are doing, it. Oregon truly is the most exciting wine region, certainly in this country, and one of the most in the world. And um, that, that's why I get enthusiastic about it as well. So you, you guys are very lucky with the Oregon Wine Board. So as Margaret said, I'm, uh, my name is Bill Shambi. Been in the wine business for about 30 years, all in the wholesale distribution. I worked for 25 years for one company in New York. Uh, five years ago, started my own wholesale distribution company. And um, I've since branched out. I have junior partners running the company. And I'm doing consulting. I'm doing things like workshops like this. I have some other um, consulting jobs where I teach. Um, uh, we do leadership training and sales training for wholesalers around the, around the United States. But uh, today's presentation, and I called it a strategic plan for distribution because hopefully um, what you're going to get out of this is uh, uh, the ability to ask yourself questions about your business that will help you develop a strategic plan for getting distribution. Now, um, we're going to give you some landmarks, and uh, there's going to be some, um, some slides up here that are about sales and marketing as we go through you'll see how the, the entire presentation will build. I want to know, how many of you in this room already have distributors in states other than Oregon? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. Who does not? Who's only distributing in Oregon or selling in Oregon? OK, so there are. I was trying to get a feel for the mix of, of people that are in the room. All right. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I've got, to, I've got to work both of these screens. Um, the, the whole presentation. Um, we're going to go over supply, production, demand, and sales, um, the landscape of the U.S. market, where wine is sold in the U.S. I mean, what markets are important, tips on how to find a distributor, what to look for, um, what are your expectations, and what are your choices uh, for sales and marketing. And at the end, I, I did an analysis of, New York, of Oregon wines in the New York market, and I'll share that with you because I think you'll find it's, um, I, I actually found it was kind of surprising how many wines are distributed in New York. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions, and I want you to ask questions. We're not going to wait till the end for questions. I want, I want a good dialogue going, because um, that's part of the fact that uh, when we film this and people get to view it later, a lot of your questions are going to bring, are probably on people's minds as they're watching this, as they would be watching it. All right, so first of all, um, first thing you need to consider is the size of your winery. And Tom brought it up, 70% of the wineries in Oregon are below 5,000, 5,000 cases or below. So we've got, I've got um, four tiers here. Uh, more than 25,000 cases, five to 25,000, one to 5,000, and under, five, under 1,000 cases. Um, how many of you fall into the top category? Anybody here? Yes? Okay, there are. How about category number two? Oh, we've got a good mix. And th category three? Most of you. Anybody in the under 1,000? Yes, OK. All right. Well, that's good. OK, the second factor you need to consider, not just what size you are, but how do you plan? What's the growth plan? What's the potential of your winery? I mean, are, are, are you? Do you plan to grow? Are you happy where you are? I mean, these are questions you need to ask yourself if you're considering distribution. Um, what factors are driving you to grow? Um, do you have a plan for that growth? And, and do you have a plan to market and sell that future growth? These are the things you need to ask yourself as you consider just going outside of Oregon, going outside of your northwest region, and going even, even um, not just national, but going to other countries and selling your wine. If you're making more than 25,000 cases, I'm going to guess you're probably nationally distributed by now. Um, 
Let me go to the next slide. So under, under the, the um, title, what's the growth plan potential of your winery, are you production driven? In other words, do you have a large amount of vineyard land that's driving your case production? Is this what's making, is, is this, you're making wine, you're bringing it into the, the, the winery, you're putting it in cases, you need to get it out. Is it vineyard land that you have and is that's what's driving your production? Or is it grape contracts? Do you, do you have long-term, medium-term, short-term grape contracts that are driving your production that you know you're gonna have to sell more next year or the same amount next year or maybe less next year? All right, or is it a business plan? In other words, did you begin with a business plan that says to your investors, we're gonna make 5,000 cases this year and 6,000 cases next year and, and 10,000 cases the year after? So these things will all drive your growth and you'll eventually need to have a place to sell those, that wine. Realizing that each of you fall into some combination of these categories who here is primarily driven by the, by the fact they have estate vineyard land? Okay, a lot of you do. That's good. You have, a, oh, I thought you had a question. Um, let me go to the next slide. The other, the other side of this is are you market driven? Some of you may be in the enviable position that you sell all the wine you make, either by reputation, in other words, you're so well known and your wines are so well received that you're actually selling out everything you make. Is anybody in that position? Yeah? Um, and so uh, the question then becomes, should I be making more wine? Can I, can I find an outlet for, this, for the more wine that I would be making? Because there, clearly demand is higher than what I can produce. Is it just a desire? And I think everybody in this room would probably answer an affirmative. Is it a desire to make the best Pinot Noir in the world? I mean, I think a lot of you probably got into the wine business because you have that desire. You want to make the best Pinot Noir in the world. And th there's no shame in growing your business because that's what you want to do. And realizing that each of you fall into all three of these categories probably. You all have some reputation that you're proud of. You all have desire to produce great wine and there's some demand out there. Outside of Oregon, how are you gonna find a way to, to sell it? So there are a, a few other factors that are not necessarily related to production that you should probably consider. And let me go to the next slide. Um, that are outside of your control. In other words, it has nothing to do with how much wine you make, how much wine you want to make, how badly you want to make great wine. But the, there are factors outside of your control that you have to consider when you're making decisions about a distributor. For instance, how many states or markets can you conceivably sell into? I mean, you, you're going to need support staff. If you're going to sell to other states, do I have people that are willing to do the billing, the compliance, um, all of the other paperwork that's associated with selling to distributors in other states. It's not an easy task, as some of you probably know, especially if you're doing this yourself. There are, I mean, I, I, I started off selling Oregon wine in 1983, 84, and um, that was when it was just Irie and Adelsheim and Ponzi and a, a handful of others. And uh, as, as some of you are probably still doing, you were harvesting the grapes, making the wine, selling the wine, probably putting labels on. Um, that's a lot of work. So if you're gonna consider distributing in other states, you've gotta have a support staff that's gonna allow you to do that or be, at least be willing to, to, or be prepared to hire people that are gonna help you because they're, Compliance is, we're one of the most regulated industries in the world, and compliance is a big deal. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know if you've sold to other states or especially if you've sold outside the country. So what are the sales potential of the states or markets you're considering? And we can look at consumption by market. Can anybody tell me what the number one wine consuming state in the U.S. is? 
Anyone want to venture a guess? California. California. California was right. And here's US wine consumption by state. And this, this data is about five years old. So Florida and New York are, are, have now switched places. I don't know wh when they, they well, this, this is about five years old. I don't know who took this uh, survey. They're very close. But I, don't, I didn't think New York was ever below Florida in consumption. But this is in millions of cases, so 56,408,000 cases for California, 18% of the market share. Uh, New York is now uh, a little more than Florida. New Jersey is in, still in number four. Uh, all the rest of them stand, New Jersey, Texas, Illinois, Massachusetts, Washington. The top 10 account for uh, more than 50% of the total. But that probably doesn't surprise too many of you. Um, New York and New Jersey have a special relationship in the fact that half a million people live in New Jersey and go to work in New York every day. So they're having lunch in New York City, probably drinking wine there when they go home. And on weekends, they're buying wine in New Jersey. Florida is so big because it's the, the heavily dependent on travel and tourism. And a lot of people go out to restaurants when they're traveling. And um, you look at the Miami area, you look at uh, the Orlando area, and those are huge markets. People are constantly eating out. There's a lot of, huge amount of chain restaurants in Florida. And um, not to mention the fact that you'd be surprised how much wine gets sucked up by cruise lines. If any of you said, does anybody sell to a cruise line? Yeah. And it's, they, can, they can buy an enormous amount of wine. So if you, if you sell uh, wine to cruise lines, if you have a distributor in either Miami or New York, or I think Charleston, I think, is a big uh, cruise stop, you wind up moving a lot of wine because they, they the, those ships have their floating hotels. They sell tons and tons of wine. So more, more than, does anybody have any questions about this? More than just the, um, the, the, the consumption by state, um, metropolitan areas tend to make um, as big or a bigger impact. From where I come from, um, New York, most distributors sell in New York and New Jersey. Generally, they open up and they sell in New York and New Jersey. Similarly, um, distributors who open in Philadelphia sell in Philadelphia and New Jersey because New Jersey not having a major metropolitan of its own, metropolitan area of its own, is, um, I mean, its suburban areas are just satellites of New York and Philadelphia. And so um, metropolitan areas, th there's an interesting chart, which I'll show you, which gives you the table wine consumption by metropolitan area, the top 20. You can see the Los Angeles, I don't know if you can read that, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Riverside is number one. Um, with over 70, what's that, 70 million per capita consumption. Doesn't tell, oh, in, in gallons, 70 million gallons. I don't know how they figure gallons, who figures that out. Uh, New York, New Jersey, number two. New York, New Jersey, Long Island, as a metropolitan area, is huge. Anybody find Portland up there? Number 16, right below Houston and above Tampa, St. Petersburg. These are the top 20 metropolitan areas in the country. And like I said, New York, New Jersey, uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia is a metropolitan area. If you go looking for distributors, you'll find that most distributors have an operation that sells uh, Maryland, DC, and Virginia because Washington, DC is very geographically, it's very tiny. But all the suburban areas around it are, you know, together it makes a huge, huge market. Okay, questions about that? Okay, there's several ways. There, 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 there are several outlets for selling your wine. There's different outlets that are going to have an impact on your strategic plan. For instance, don't underestimate the value of a tasting room. Um, it's 100% retail, as you probably all know. 
um, and you get your money immediately. When you sell out of the tasting room, it's cash in the register. And that's really good uh, from, a, from, a, from a small business perspective. I'm sure you understand that having a tasting room can generate a lot of cash flow for your operation. Winery Direct, wine clubs, uh, internet sales. It's a little bit more paperwork, but it's all retail. You get paid right away. Um, it, it also, it's goodwill. It's a goodwill builder, I think. Wouldn't you say? Um, how many of you run wine clubs or have wine clubs? Oh, virtually everybody. That's good. Wholesale distribution in your home state. In other words, here in Oregon. That, if, if, if some of you have only just started distributing in the state of Oregon, um, it's probably your easiest sell, right? Um, it, it directs local customers back to the winery. That's an additional benefit. So, I mean, you sell to restaurants in Portland, people say, hey, let's go out to Willamette Valley and go visit the winery we had at that restaurant. Or, they, or then they go back to Portland or to uh, um, wherever they are to, I can't think of another city down south, Corvallis. <laughs> And they buy, you know, they buy your wine. So it's, it actually redirects, it redirects people back to your wines, which is uh, very good. It gives you a steady flow of goods out of the winery, and it's repeat business. Because when you, as soon as you put your toe in the water of wholesale distribution, you realize that the wine starts to pull through because there's demand there. There's demand that it, you don't have to be in the tasting room. You have to be in the tasting room to sell wine in the tasting room, but you don't have to be in the t you know, at the winery when wholesalers are selling it either in Oregon or other states. And that's good. It helps you sleep at night. And wholesale distribution on a national level gives you the most options. It's the steadiest flow of goods out of the winery. Um, you're not getting paid immediately. You have a little longer terms. And, and if you're talking about your cash flow, that has an impact. But the fact is, the more states you have, you're spreading your, your risk around to more places. And so you don't have to depend on just the tasting room or just the wine club or when you release something. You've got, you've got outlets for your wine that are happening all the time. And that's actually a very good thing. Um, anybody here who, for whom like tasting room and direct wine sales is the majority of their sales? Yeah? OK. By dollar, let's put it by dollar. Yeah, okay, that's good. I mean, it is good to have a tasting, I mean, it's good to have tasting rooms. They build a lot of goodwill and, and they get people very excited about your wine because they're there, they're in front of you, you're telling the story, you've got what I like to call the sunset effect. It's that, that, <laughs> that, that bottle of wine you had in Provence on the terrace with the sunset that was so good. When you got it home, it didn't taste quite as good, but you have the memory. You know, you still have the memory. And and of course, I mean, this the, the Willamette Valley is so beautiful. I, I think you can attribute the sunset effect as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's take a look at factors that determine the mix of your strategic plan. You've got needs. You have cash flow needs. You want to move things out of the winery. You need a steady flow of product, and you may want a national presence. Now, home state regional distribution gives you a steady flow of sales, but at least you've spread, you have longer terms, but you've spread your risk over several distributors. National distribution gives you a very steady flow of goods um, and longer terms, but at least you've spread your brand around again over many distributors, and it starts to build a national presence for you in the, in the, in the wine press. Um, people start talking about you. People start blogging about you. It, um, distributing nationally um, is, is, gives you this presence that you don't have when you're simply selling wine out of the winery or in your home state. So the best you know, you may look at this and see, well, where are my priorities? Is it cash flow? Is it steady flow of product out of the winery? Do I really want a national presence? The fact is, you look at it like a 401k investment. You know, some, you want to spread your risk around and have more options, so some combination of all of these is probably what you want. 
So you want to have a tasting room. You want to make sure you have a strong local market, and you want to have some national distribution. Depending on the size of your winery, again, it may, it, it may impact where your priority lies. All right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we're coming to the end of this section. Oh, no, I've got, I'm sorry, I have, um, I have some examples of six different wineries that I pulled, in Cal three in California and three in Oregon. And different size wineries, 35,000 cases, 12,000 cases, 3,000 cases. And in Oregon, about the same, 34, 12, and 4. So take a look at this. And um, it breaks down their sales, their total production, into winery direct sales, including the tasting room, home state distribution, all their distribution, and then how many states. So you can see in, in terms of um, winery direct sales, including the tasting room at 35,000 case level, um, New York, I mean California and Oregon are pretty similar, 14 and 15 percent. But you'll notice home state distribution is much greater in California than it is in Oregon. 29 percent, 32, 35 percent, simply because the state of California is so much bigger. You saw back on our consumption table um, that the state of California is, is the number one consumer in the, in the country anyway. You'll also notice this, as the size of the winery decreases, tasting room sales decrease as a percentage. I'm sorry, tasting room sales increase as a percentage. So winery direct sales 14% here, 15% here, but as you go down here, it's 22%. Now this winery is an anomaly. They sell 33% of their sales are direct sales in the tasting room, but that's, that's not normal. This number should be in the 20s. It probably should be around 20%. And here we've got number of states. So this gives you a little benchmark. If you're, if you're, like you're a 3,000 case winery and you're going like, I don't know, how many, how many states do people sell to? You know, 9, 11, that's not uncommon. And it's not, uh, you don't need to be everywhere. I don't want you to, certainly you should not be thinking of going into wholesale distribution as all or nothing. You know, you start with Oregon, you start with the Pacific Northwest, California. You may go to uh, some of the other major markets that we talked about before. Uh, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, New York. You may not want to go to New York. You know, it's pretty far away. And, and there's, I'll, I'll give you some reasons why maybe New York isn't your best option, at least not your first option. We'll give you some reasons later. So how many, how many of you up here see a parallel among your own wine distribution to what you see up here? Anybody, anybody's numbers kind of line up with what you see up here? I've got to guess some of you do. So how many of you are ready to choose, go out and start picking distributors? You ready to do that? All right, because that's what we're going to start, that's what we're going to go, go to now. So choosing a distributor is not the same as finding a marketing company. They're two different things, and I'm going to distinguish those from here on as we go through the presentation. We'll talk about distributors, and then we'll talk about sales and marketing companies. But they're two different things. All right, you're probably going to choose distri a distributor first. You're, you're, you're market, sales and marketing companies come later. You, as the winery owner, or as, um, as as the person in charge of selling the wine for the winery, you're going to go out and pick your distributor state by state, one state at a time, um, because you're probably growing your wine, growing your brand from smaller to bigger. Nobody steps into uh, a fifty thousand case winery. All right, so. You may hire a marketing company to manage your distributors down the road, but the first thing you're going to do is pick distributors. All right? I'll go to the next slide. How do you find a distributor? It's probably the question that everybody thinks is going to get answered here in this, in this uh, workshop, and I hope it is. There's, unfortunately, there's no reliable listing of wholesale distributors in the US. I cannot find one. 
All right, Double Wine and Spirits Wholesalers Association only lists their 350 members, and half of those members are wineries and breweries. And I know there's a lot more uh, distributors out there than that. Uh, there's the Beverage Trade Network, uh, but it has a very incomplete list. It's more of a, it's more of an advertising tool than anything else. It's not, it's not an accurate uh, listing of all the wholesalers, uh, wholesale distributors in the country. There are over, just to give you an idea, there's over 200 wholesalers in the, New, in the state of New York alone. Now, New York's a very robust um, wholesale wine distribution state. Much more, I would, I would guess that there's probably more in New York than there are in any other state. There's actually like more than 230. But um, those, those last 30 are, they, they may be licenses that are held but not used because I can't even find, I can't find any evidence that they're actually selling wine. Uh, and there are about 2,000 wholesalers in the US, which if you divide it by 50 states, that's about, averages out to about 40 each. In some, there's five to 10. And in states like New York, there's over 200. So how do you go about finding a distributor in like New York, or Chicago, or Florida. How do you find a good distributor? Well, the best answer I can give you is colleagues, friends, and neighbors. And you may think that's, you know, that, that it's not a very scientific answer, but in my experience of 30 years in the wine business, um, of the companies I've worked for, most wineries that have come to me, I've, the first question I ask is, well, why, what made you call me? Well, I talked to Bob down the road, and he has, Bob, you know, your friend who is a distributor, uh, has you as a distributor, and he says you guys are great. And so almost all of the referrals f uh, in, that I've dealt with of new wineries coming to my dis distribution company have been referred to by other wineries who are happy with what they did. So, I mean, there's no clearinghouse, there's no morning star ratings to consult. So what you want to do is you want to find out who's happy with their distributor and why are they happy. And these are people you're going to see at tastings. They're going to be standing next to you at tables, for, at, at, at events, either around the state or around other states where you have similar distribution. You may be shopping for a distributor in Florida and say, hey, Ellen, who's your distributor in, in Florida? I, I don't have one. And she might tell you either a good story or a bad story about who her distributor is. But that's your best, that is your best um, reference, is talking to your, your, your friends and neighbors. Um, what you want to do, lastly, is make what, find out what your priorities are and make a list. In other words, what's going to make you happiest about having a distributor? Now, stop and ask yourself, what's important to me? In other words, what qualities am I most looking for in a distributor when I want my brand represented in a place like New York or Florida? So take a look at these. What is important to you? Getting paid on time? Is that important to a lot of people, right? That's probably the most important thing that, especially some of you smaller wineries that are considering right now. Don't forget though, every, distri every distributor struggles with the same problem as well, getting paid on time. Um, is it sales performance? And under sales performance, I've got four, four major points here. Um, is it follow through on goals and objectives? In other words, do you have goals that you know you need to sell. And so you want a distributor who understands that when you say, I've got 300 cases for Chicago, that they sell that 300 cases. Because if they only sell 150, you've now got 150 cases that don't have a state alloc allocated to any place to go. And you've got to find another place to sell them. So I mean, that's important. If you're very case goal driven, if you need to clear that warehouse out every year to make your plan, then you need to know that your distributor is going to be on board with you with that plan. 
is, is it the class of trade? In other words, do you care whether your, your wine is sold in grocery or chain stores? Or does it only have to be in what I call white tablecloth retailers? Does it matter to you? I mean, that's important. It's, to some people it does matter. To others, it's not, it's not so important. A depletion is a depletion. But for, for some people, this is a very important point. And you need, if this, is, if this is on your list of priorities, when you're investigating distributors, you need to know, are they good at that? Does it matter about the channel, on or off premise? To some wineries, on premise, they want on premise distribution. They want 60% or 70% on premise. To others, it's not important. They want a mix, but, but it's not important that it be so one way or the other. Once again, you, you have to have a mix of both, but for some wineries, that's an important one. Or is it just the number of cases? I don't care where it goes, I just want to make sure you take it and you pay me for it. And that's okay too. Is it accountability? Um, is it important for you to know, for instance, where your wine is sold, when it's sold, who's buying it, et cetera? And can you get that information when you want it? Not all distributors are good at sharing their information. Okay, They're, some are better than others, but not a, a lot of them feel, you sold me the wine, I paid you for it, just leave me alone. Others are very transparent, and they'll work with you, and they'll, they'll tell you everything about where your wine is sold. Are you comfortable doing business with the person on the other end of the supply chain? Your relationship. Okay, your relationship with that distributor. How friendly is management? <clears throat> That's important to a lot of people. I will tell you, from my perspective, it's the most important. It's actually the most important factor that has driven um, all the business I've done, is the relationships I've had with the wineries that I've sold. And um, when you have that relationship, all these other things tend to get resolved because you can talk to that person, you can get them on the phone, et cetera. You, you know you, you've got transparency, you're getting the feedback from them. And so if you have a good relationship, all the other things tend to follow. If you don't, if you don't like doing business with this person, chances are all these other things are going to be problems. And lastly, how much attention will I be getting? How much attention will my brand be getting in this distributor? And we're going to go and we're going to see on some future slides here how that works out and how um, I'm not going to tell you how you can get more attention because it, it, each distributor is different. But it, it, it will matter as to how much business you do and how successful your strategic plan will be. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let's narrow down the field. Oh, there we go. So let's narrow down the field. How big is the market I'm looking at? Do you want to be in the five largest markets in the country? Or are you satisfied with staying in the Pacific Northwest? You know, because being in the five largest markets means you're going to have to go to those markets or spend money or pay someone to go to those markets. Right? So don't forget there's, there's costs associated with that, and we'll, we've got another, we'll look at that in a second. Am I looking for a one-person operation? You know, a $1 million wholesaler, a $10 million, a $100 million? Do I want to be in a medium-sized distributor? Do I want to be in one of the bigger ones? Because I know, A, they'll buy all my production, B, they'll pay me early, C, it's a constant flow of goods out the door. You may be trading off the fact that you don't get information from that distributor or some other, uh, something else that you're not getting. But if, if, if depletions is what's important to you, then maybe you want to be with a $100 million distributor. If having a close personal relationship with the owner and knowing where all your cases go and being in the market and seeing the restaurants that it's sold at, 
perhaps the one million dollar distributor or ten million dollar distributor. There's, there's all gradations in between, but you've got to look at those factors. Um, portfolio size, overall number of SKUs. In other words, how many wines are in this distributor's portfolio already? It's because there's no limit to the amount of, the number of cases that a distributor can sell. I can tell you that yeah, I, well, I worked at a distributor, distributor that grew from $5 million to $130 million. And the sky's the limit. There is a limit to the number of wines you can represent. Because at the granular level, every salesperson has to represent all those wines. So it, where, where the bottleneck occurs is when you get down to the one-on-one, -on -one, the salesperson with the customer, he's got a book with 1,300 SKUs in it. That's OK. You can deal with 1,300 SKUs. I have salespeople who've worked for me who sell seven or 800 SKUs different wines over the course of a year. But if you have a distributor that has a book that has 3,000 or 3,500, maybe you're going to get lost. But I can also tell you an exception to that. There's a distributor in New York called Michael Skernick. I don't know if any of you are with Skernick. He has over 3,300 SKUs in his portfolio, and he does a good job of managing them. I don't know how he does it, but he does. But um, I know that generally under 2,000 is about the limit for what the, that salesperson can adequately represent. Even when you get up to like 50 salespeople in the organization, some salespeople will sell some things and other salespeople will sell other things. And as a distributor, that's what you look at. You figure not everybody's going to sell everything, but I have some people that are champions in this brand and some, some people that are champions of that brand. And eventually it all gets sold. Um, not everybody will sell everything. But it's important. How unique is my winery in that portfolio? Uniqueness can also be negative. I mean, you don't want to be the only domestic wine in a portfolio of all Italian wines. But as an Oregon Pinot Noir producer, you might want to be the only Oregon Pinot Noir in a portfolio full of Burgundies. That would be good. So uniqueness can go either way. But you, you probably don't want to be one of 18 Oregon Pinot Noir producers in a portfolio, because that distributor probably has as much as he can handle, unless you're, you're very different. Size of the sales staff, how many reps are in the market, these are things you want to know when you're interviewing a distributor. And how many customers does the distributor impact? That's probably best expressed as a percentage of the number of customers in any given market. In New York State, there's 10,000 licensees, roughly, 10,000 and something. In other words, 10,000 businesses hold licenses to sell wine. Now, you can sell wine, you can't sell wine in grocery stores, but you have all kinds of little stores all over. Just think of the five boroughs of Manhattan. You've got everything from Sherry Lehman on the corner of Park Avenue and 59th Street to a little bulletproof store in, in Bensonhurst. You know, when I say bulletproof, they've got like the plexiglass with the, you put the money under the thing just like the bank. I mean, we have those. I know it probably sounds funny to you, but we do. We call them bulletproof stores. Some actually, some actually a few of them actually do well, but um, I think they're selling to their cousins or something because they're not buying this expensive wine to sell, you know, through the window. Um, but in New York State, there's 10,000 licensees. But when I started Verity, Wine Partners in 2009, part of our business plan was we analyzed, well, how, to get to where we wanted to go, how many customers would we actually have to sell? And we figured out that of, in the fine wine business, 80% of the fine wine is sold in about 1,800 customers. 1,800 to 2,000 customers. Out of the 10,000, buy 80% of the fine wine. The other 8,000 are buying mass market brands that w my company wasn't going to represent. So, um, armed with that information about a market, you know you can know that, well, just because there's 10,000 licensees in the state of New York and your distributor is only selling to 1,500, that's not a bad thing, because as long as he's selling to the right 1,500, that's okay. You're going you're gonna to grab a lot of the fine wine business, because I'm just making an assumption, everyone here is in the fine wine business. You know, nobody's making jug wine here.
Okay, we're going to get into a little more information about distributors. And I call this navigating the distributor landscape. Um, we have what we call a three-tier system, mostly in this country. Does anybody not know what the three-tier system is? This is I'm going to explain it. You go from winery to distributor to retailer. This has been since prohibition in almost every state. Uh, they're not identical, but they're mostly identical. Um, we, need, we need to talk about pricing. What's gross profit, gross margin, what's markup? Anybody confused by the terms gross, uh, gross profit and markup and margin? Because a, a, a lot of people confuse that when they come to me as a distributor. And discounting, DAs, SPAs, and FSAs, which we'll get in here to in a second. The three-tier system. Okay, most, oops. Most state laws require it. It was started after prohibition to keep criminals out of, out of the wine and liquor business, yes? A uh, special pricing allowance and floor stock adjustment. We're going to we're going to go over these in the consecutive slides. So um, we started after prohibition. It allows for orderly distribution of products. What I like to call orderly distribution of products. And when I say that, it means that you could never fulfill every order for every retailer or restaurant tour if you were trying to sell wine right out of the winery. You just can't do it. You need that distribution hub. You need somebody who's buying wine from everybody, storing it in a warehouse, and sending it out on trucks every day. Um, I know it, there's, there are models out there that would love to be able to just sell everything on the internet directly from the winery, but I don't think that's ever going to happen because, I mean, there's a certain percentage, and that will happen, and that's good. It's good for you. But restaurants who call up at 4 o'clock on a Thursday and want wine on Friday for the weekend, that can only happen when you have a distributor. Um, it gives you less control over your retail price, though. I mean, you may have a national suggested retail price, um, but retailers can legally charge whatever they want. And if that upsets, if that's really going to upset you, you have to know that that's, that may be what happens, and you may not have any control over it. Some states tightly regulate that. They, they, if you, if you insist that your distributor tell somebody how much they can sell the wine for, they call that price fixing and they say you can't do it. All right? And direct to consumer via, via internet is becoming more accepted by state agencies. I know the New York State has, uh, New York State has said it will not stand in the way of retail sales as long as they comply with current law. Ever since Granholm um, came down, uh, the, the being able to sell into other states, and some of you may, you have to register with the state of New York if you want to sell directly, but you can sell directly to consumers in New York if you register with the state. And I think you have to collect tax. I'm not sure, I think you have to collect sales tax. All right, so they are allowing, uh, uh, states like New York are allowing some bleed through to go directly from um, from wineries to consumers in the state of New York, and other states have done it as well. How many, anybody can tell me how many states have um, those direct shipping 46. allowance? 46? I think, I mean, they all have to comply, I believe. Although I'm not sure about control states like Pennsylvania. They, do they allow it? No, Utah. Right, so Pennsylvania, Utah, there's a few that don't. Okay. Arkansas. Arkansas. Massachusetts doesn't allow? It does allow, but it doesn't allow that, but, but UPS has to register their entire fleet to haul it across the border, so UPS chooses not to do that. And they kind of make it, yeah, they make it impossible, huh? Yep. An on-site visit from the within the calendar year from the customer. Oh, so a customer, for instance, in Maryland has to have visited the winery? Really? Who does that? How do they enforce that? How do you enforce that? Yeah, they don't. They just don't. Wow. An, an, an in-state visit. 
All right, so once your product gets into distribution, I put together here what I call the pricing pyramid. Um, you're going to sell your wine at, at the FOB fr um, freight outbound plus freight and taxes equals the lading cost. So your cost, this is the FOB, plus the freight to get it to your distributor, and plus there's almost always a tax involved, equals the lading cost. And that's, that's something distributors talk about all the time. What's the lading cost of the wine? The lading cost plus the distributor markup equals the wholesale price. And the wholesale price plus the retail markup equals the retail price. So you can see where this is going. You can see where this is going. And the next slide I call, how, how does my wine get from $5.33 to $12.50 when I get a distributor? So take a look at this. Um, you've got an FOB, imaginary FOB of $64 a case. I don't think anybody's is that small unless you're selling six packs. Um, but I did this, and you'll see why. It's, it makes it, makes it easy, makes the math easy. So your FOB is $5.33 a bottle. Freight and tax to New York right now is about eight bucks a case. So your lading cost is 72. Distributor markup, $28. That's a 39% markup. That's pretty standard. Now that's markup on the $72. The wholesale price makes it $100 a case or 28% gross profit. That's very normal for a distributor. The wholesaler then sells it to a retailer who marks it up 50% or $50 on that case. Well, they rarely sell by the case, but for, for illustration purposes, it makes it easy. The retail price then becomes $150, 33% gross profit, 50% markup, 33% gross profit or $12.50 a bottle. So that's how it gets there. Such a short distance to go to more than double the price of the wine, but that's what happens. And um, it's, I'd like to tell you that, um, that you can cut corners on this, but by and large, you can't. Can anybody tell me, and I mean, you may think, God, why is the retailer making 50% markup and the distributor is making a 39% markup, 28% gross profit? These guys must be getting rich, right? Because I'm not, right? As a winery, you're saying, I'm not getting rich. Somebody's getting rich. I actually, I don't know about the retailers getting rich, but I can tell you everything about the distributor markup. Does anybody, can anybody tell me what the net profit is, the average net profit for a wholesale wine distributor in the US? That's net, as that comes after taxes. EBITDA after tax, after what, what the ownership would take home. It's between 2 and 4% is all it is. Oh, I'm sorry, between 2 and 6%. Average is about 4%. Believe it or not. And that's been my experience in 25 years in the wine business. Some people might make a little bit more. I hope nobody makes less. Why go through all this trouble for 2%? But I can tell you that, that I mean, I've been, I was involved, obviously, at, at the vice president level at the company I used to work for, now that I own a company, I can tell you from the, the, you know, the balance sheets, it's not that much. Retailers, I mean, uh, retailers have quite a lot of cost involved as well. I mean, they're selling wine by the bottle, and they've got to stock two or three thousand or, uh, SKUs or more, and they've got to have at least a case of all this stuff. So, you know, retail floor space is expensive, you've got to have a lot more people on the floor. All this stuff costs money. So, it, I mean, we're talking about retail, dist I mean, the wholesale distribution around the country. It comes at a cost. Hello? Yeah. How consistent is that 39% distributor markup? Pretty consistent. And well, actually, most distributors won't even talk about markup. Uh, they don't even think, they think in terms of gross profit. And 20, 26 to 30% is I'll tell you it's standard in the, in the East. In New York, I can tell you I have some of the highest costs of warehousing and delivery of anywhere in the country. Uh, getting product there, seven to eight dollars plus, uh, and taxes are not high on wine in New York. It's only 75 cents a case, which is, which is nothing. It's like, I don't know, it's like nine cents a 
no, I can't remember. They, they give it to you in gallons, but it works out to be about 75 cents a case. But um, of this $28 on this $100 case, 18 of it is gone just in uh, warehouse and commission, warehouse delivery and commission. Then I've got the office to keep open and all the other, all the other costs, cost of money, all kinds of other things. So um, it, it's, th this is pretty standard, 28% gross profit. I, I, I put the markup in because I wanted to put the markup in at each level so you would see what it was. Um, but I only think in terms of gross profit. I use this number 39's in a, in a formula that's in a pricing grid that I use all the time. When I meet with suppliers, they come and tell me what their FOB is, and I can immediately tell what the wine's gonna sell for. I have what I'm gonna sell it for, and it calculates what, what the retail price is gonna be. You have to think about that. Uh, you as, as, you as the question, so. I'm sorry, yes. I, actually, I think I wrote that question down. Um, how do you make sure that your retail, that's gonna be, that your nationally recommended retail or suggested retail is gonna be the same that you sell, as what you sell at the winery out of the retail store versus what's sold in New York? And how important is it that if it's not, that you adjust your FOB so that the retail price can be the same around the country? It is important that you do that. Nobody's suggesting you take a loss. What you may have to do is raise your retail price or raise your expectation of retail price. And for, any of, for those of you who, have not, who don't have distribution anywhere outside of Oregon, I would strongly recommend that you figure out, that you put in all these numbers and figure out what you should be selling at retail out of the winery. And <clears throat> the good news about that is you take all that home. So you may sell it for $12.50 out of the winery and you don't have any of these people in between, your accountant's gonna love you. Okay, but you should build in a national retail price before you even start selling to distributors. You should do it right here in Oregon. Okay, it's important that you do that. I meet with, I, I've met with um, wineries who've never sold, it happens more often in New York State, who have never sold through a distributor, and it, I'm, what I'm saying it happens with New York State wineries, and their retail price is too low compared to their FOB, and they're going like, well, wait a second, but I sell this for $12 at the winery, um, I, you, you're telling me it's going to be $15, and I'm going like, you should be selling it for $15 at the winery so that we can sell it for $15, so the retailer can sell it for $15. Okay, you have to figure that cost in. You have to figure those extra costs in and take the markup. You take that and put it back into your retail, um, retail space, the winery tasting room. Yes, Michael. Uh, so the interesting thing about wine is, um, you know, it's not like other uh, manufactured products where it's uh, standard cost to make because there's a quality factor built into your mm -hmm. pricing. So when, when you get, uh, you're talking to a new uh, prospective uh, producer, mm -hmm. and they say, here are my wines, here's the uh, retail price on them at the winery. Uh, and you know, after tasting tens of thousands of wines, you, you go through them, and you can probably, after tasting them, say, I can sell that for $15. Well, this one, uh, maybe 12, this one, 22, and so mm -hmm. on. Is that an exercise you go through? And I think a lot of times, maybe the producer has an unrealistic um, view of the quality level of their wines. It's no. <laughs> no. You're not suggesting. So how do, you, how do you get them to you put them together with a competitive set and yeah. say, here's who you're competing against? What do you think? Yeah. The question is, uh, when, you, when you, very often in the wholesale wine business, that's why I'm going to repeat the question. So the question is, when, when, you, um, when you taste wines that have come from, um, from a winery, you have an idea as a distributor what quality level that wine is at. It's a, it's a, it's a, subjective, it's a subjective process, but having done it,
for so long, you know what you think that wine should sell for. And how the question is, how often do you get wineries bringing you wines that say this is a fifteen, this sells for fifteen dollars, and you have it in your mind that that's really a twelve dollar wine? How do you how do you confront that, and what do you do about it? And we do we do have this happen to us quite often. We'll um, we'll get wines presented to us. We'll taste them. We'll either put them in mentally into a price category, or we'll, or we'll have the pricing in front of us, and we can say. The wines are very good across the board. The packaging's very good, but their price points are off by about 25% each, at each price level. And so then you have that conversation with the winery and say, look, I, don't, I, have, I have other wines that are similar and sell for this price. And the, 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 the winery, you may be able to show the winery a competitive set of another wine, either from the same appellation or that's the same varietal that, and it, that it should sell for less or sometimes more. The, the nice thing is when you taste wines that someone brings you and you say, wow, that tastes like a $20 bottle. And they say, well, the FOB is only, only $6.50, so you can sell it for $16. That means you're, del you're delivering, uh, you're over delivering on quality for price. And that's great. We, we, we love that. <laughs> but, um, but it never, <laughs> but what's that? Right, everybody can over deliver. And there, I mean, you know better than I do. There are certain costs associated with making, producing a wine that don't necessarily have anything to do with the price of the wine, the eventual price of the wine. But the, also the fact is, wines that sell for two or three hundred dollars a bottle, you, pro, you can't go back and find all those production costs in that bottle. Someone once told me the most you can put into a bottle of wine in terms of uh, grapes, glass, fermentation, barrels, all that stuff is somewhere in the $50 range. Is that right? Does anybody, does anybody know that to be a fact? I mean, I don't know that to be a fact, but I mean, so, so where do you get wines that sell for two or $300 a bottle? It's mortgage, image, uh, you name it. 97 point score, 99 point score. There's all those things. But um, yes, we sometimes, sometimes, very rarely, does a, a, wine, a winery come in and say, but my wine's worth a whole lot more. That almost never happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a question there? Uh, Jill, a distributor talking to a distributor. What I have done in those cases is said, um, um, in a nice way, go out and do market research. Go out into these stores and, and um, compare your wine mm -hmm. to these others so they can come at a realistic price point. And then maybe they'll come back and visit me and we'll do the math backwards. And sometimes they just can't work on that FOB. And that's right. too. Yeah. Just even on the shelf. Not a question, but to repeat what the young lady just said is that sometimes you need to go out as a winery and do the competitive research yourself and see who else is selling what I'm selling or something similar to what I'm selling and what are they charging for it. How did you get in here? You're a distributor. You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. You're welcome. So, any other questions about um, this example I used for? Getting from FOB to retail, yes, sir. Bill, in your experience, uh, what have you seen from the standpoint of wineries in terms of how they're pricing their wholesale price in relation to freight costs? Not everybody is going to have, let's say, warehouse in California for consolidation to pick up. Right. Well, this freight cost that I'm talking about here is just what it costs me to get it as a wholesaler, as a distributor, from wherever you're warehousing it to me. Any cost that that I know a lot of you probably warehouse in California, because that's where all, the, where all the trucks are coming from. And so whatever those costs are, you've got to f you need to put that into your FOB. In other words, if your FOB out of Oregon, and actually, I have a couple of Oregon wineries, or have had in the past, that have two different FOBs. There's an FOB out of California, and there's an FOB out of Oregon. And so they give me the choice. Do you want to come to Oregon and pick it up? So then I got to look at my trucking. Is it cheaper to pick it up in Oregon? Do I lose the spread? It's $4 more in, Ar uh, $4 more in California. But if I'm picking up a whole container from the same warehouse, a whole truck, it's OK. Um, if, I'm, if I got to go to Oregon just for 56 cases, that's a, a less than a load, and I have to pay consolidation fees for the truck that's eventually just going to go to California anyway before it turns east and goes to the west coast. So yes, if you have freight costs, you need to put those into your FOB.
Yes, more questions. Uh, this is kind of taking one more step back from the FOB to retail. Um, but a lot of these markups, you just kind of like threw in a general what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, what's the typical markup from production cost to FOB? Mm -hmm. If you would know that. I don't know. That's, that's a winery question. You guys know what that is. That's a different class. I don't teach that class. I don't teach that class. Oh, well, the question, sorry, the question was, what's the markup between production costs and FOB? And I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. Yes? Um, I have a question about how to manage exceptions to the retail markup. So specifically, I've had a few issues with specifically internet retailers who choose to take a much lower markup, mm -hmm. which then creates a retail price that's lower than other retail prices, mm -hmm. um, including my own. And I'm wondering what advice you would have. To what you advice? Know. OK, the question is, what happens when a retailer does not take a 50% markup uh, in, a, in a state that's all the way on the other side of the country, say New Jersey? Um, <laughs> and I'm sure that's what you're all talking about. Um, and what can you do? And takes a much lower markup and kind of now with um, Wine Searcher uh, uh, and other internet tools, kind of pisses off either other clients that you have, other distributors, or retailers in your own home state, uh, or wine club customers who said, I paid $22 a bottle from you. I see um, uh, wine libraries selling it for 18 What can you do about that? I mentioned in an earlier slide that you have one of the, one of the drawbacks of distribution is you're going to have less control over your retail price. What I always advise people, as, as a wholesaler, put yourself in my shoes. So I've got to go to this retailer, and he's, not, he's taking maybe a 30% markup, not a 50% markup, who I'm doing $700,000 worth of business with in all my wines, and I've got one very nice, very valuable Oregon supplier who's saying to me, those damn guys are selling my wine for 20% you know, off what I'm, what I'm selling it everywhere else. Can you do anything about it? Generally, if you have a good relationship, you can ask. You can't tell them, but you can ask. In other words, the, the wholesaler, the distributor can ask the retailer. If that doesn't work, a call from the winery can help. And it, actually, if you have a good relationship, and you should have a good, generally these are the, some of the biggest retailers in any market. It, it actually pays for you as a winery to develop a relationship with those people and a nice one, you have to be polite and say, look, I love selling, I love that you love my wine. I love, you build them up. I love that you're marketing my wine to people. You're telling people on your website it's so terrific, but really, you're killing me. Can you put the price up? Maybe just a lot of, what a lot of these stores will do is they'll say, okay, I'll put the price up, but I'm gonna send out an email to my top 500 customers with the special price. If they bring the email in, they'll get the special price, but at least it's not, advertised. So there's a couple ways you can deal with that. Those, those are the ways. But calling up a retailer and using expletives and saying, I'm not selling you another case of my wine again, I can tell you that that doesn't work. And in some states, it's against the law for us as the wholesaler to say we won't sell to you. New York is one of them. New York, and they've cracked down on that. We can't tell somebody we won't sell them wine if we have the product in, especially if it's because it's being sold at a lower price. The state is pointing at us and saying, you're anti-competitive. You can't do that. Yes, Ellen? That brings up a really good point um, regarding on and off premise. So when you have a winery that's asking for uh, a percentage of on and off premise target, mm -hmm. how do you manage that if you have the product in stock and retailers are asking for it and you have the rest of the wine dealer who needs to go to on premise to get their target? The question is, how do you manage, as a distributor, what if a winery is telling you, I want a certain percentage to go of my wine to go to on-premise, and a certain percentage to go to off-premise? Um, as a distributor, how do you manage that? Because in some states, like it, 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 they consider that anti-competitive that you would sell to one class of trade and not another, especially if you, you, tell, you tell a retailer that you don't have any wine when you actually do have it in stock. The state, we just addressed this with the state of New York. Luckily, I belong to what's called a fine wine alliance. There's 18 
fine wine wholesalers um, in New York State who formed an alliance to, to sort of lobby and deal with both legislative and regulatory issues. And we brought, because we're fine wine wholesalers, we brought this up to the director of the SLA. And we said, look, this is a problem. We're not trying to skirt the law. We're not trying to be anti-competitive. We have wineries who say, look, I can sell 1,000 cases in New York, and I only have 200. So I want to be able to pick and choose where they go. I want 150 of them or 140 of them to go to these 37 Zagat-rated Michelin-starred restaurants, and the rest you can sell to retail. We explained that to, to the, the director of the SLA, that there are instances where we have to allocate wine. And so they came up with a plan, working with us, to where we, we can allocate wine. We have to file an allocation plan with the state for every wine we do this with. They, what they want mostly is transparency. They want us to say, OK, what are you going to do? What is your plan? Well, our plan is to sell 70% of this wine. They, they allow up to 70% to go to either channel, which was more than I ever expected. Don't tell any of my other California wineries this, because <laughs> that's where they invented the idea. Um, as long as we tell them. Now, then that brought up, uh, and, and th they, there are certain restrictions, not restrictions, yeah, there are certain restrictions. They say you, um, if, if it's not directed by channel, but the fact is um, we only get 100 cases, and we sold to these 32 customers last year, they say, okay, if repeat business is what the winery wants. In other words, the winery said, look, these guys, these same 32 customers have bought my wine for the last 10 vintages. You can't just then blow it out to one retailer or sell it to just anybody who comes in the door. So they said, you can allocate to previous customers. You just have to take 10% and allocate that to new customers. Well, luckily in New York, 10% of your customers go out of business every year, so, and you get new ones. So, so, so that it happens. It, it, it happens naturally. <clears throat> oh, is that, that answers the question sufficiently. Yes? In state in Oregon, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yes, the question is, the question is, um, you ha this gentleman has a broker in Oregon, and, and he sells, can you sell legally, you can sell directly from the winery to a restaurant or a retailer in, in Oregon? Okay, so, okay, so in state, that works well. You have a broker who goes around and does the work that you can't do, because you're probably doing everything else, including cleaning the barrels and making the wine. And um, in, within the state of Oregon, you can sell directly, you can bill the wine from the winery directly to the retailer restaurateur. In other states, you're going to have to have a distributor because every state requires, every state that I know, you have to have some sort of distribution license. Unless it's like Pennsylvania, and then the state is the distributor. Um, he, he has a wholesale license? Right, but you can't, you, for instance, you can't ship a case of wine to New York state unless there's a distributor in New York state they're ready to receive the goods and pay you for it. Well the distributor is a wholesaler. I'm, I use those terms interchangeably. Oh, okay. by the, so distributor and a wholesaler, same thing. You have to have my a wholesale. Is my guy doesn't, he, he doesn't buy a pellet of wine and pay me for it. Right. He does to go out right. and sell it and I give him a commission and then we've got three different ways to get wine to the customer, the retailer. That model works. The model of having a broker uh, to sell your wine works within the state of Oregon, but it wouldn't work unless you had a distributor in these other states. Yes? You know, I think that they, there, there are some states like Oregon, Massachusetts is another one that yeah. can sell distributors. California, too. That's essentially what's happening is, yeah. you know, those guys representing them, and so the wine is essentially self-distributing. Right. Self-distributing is, is legal, I think, in almost every state. In New York, wineries can sell directly both to consumers. They can have up to nine retail outlets, and they can sell directly to all uh, a winery in New York State, and there's a number of them. I don't know if you've heard, they make wine in New York State. <laughs> that, was the, that was the thing I ran into my first 10 years selling Oregon wine, even still today. They, they make wine in Oregon. But so, yes, um, within the state, um, you can have that license. And you, as a winery, you could hire somebody, it's called, quote, a broker, who just takes commission and goes around and does that work for you. 
with, usually within each state. And it was the same in New Jersey. New Jersey wineries can sell to New Jersey uh, retail and restaurant customers. They, if they want to go to another state, they have to get a distributor. Okay. Any other questions about these? Yes? Um, related to that uh, question, the idea of having some kind of representative for the winery uh, helping the distributor sales reps to be more successful, pouring, mm -hmm. building relationships, but not actually taking the order. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like you know double uh, double duty? Uh, uh, is there an issue that maybe the sales reps aren't spending enough focus on your wines? Uh, you know, what's the decision factor there? Okay, the question is about having a, either a broker or a marketing company in a state or in a group of states where you already have distribution, wholesale distribution, is um, and we're actually going to go through that whole sales and marketing companies um, uh, later in the, in, the, in the program, and I'll address that. But is it, the short answer, is it double work? Not necessarily. You may need, you need somebody to manage your distributors. That somebody may be you, may be the owner of the winery, may be the vice president of sales and marketing at your winery, or it might be a marketing company out there. I'll show you how the whole, how the whole landscape goes after this. <laughs>